Okay, welcome to lesson nine, the last lesson in our evolution unit. And today we're going to be looking at macro evolution, which is the large scale evolution, which kind of uh, in, kind of incorporates the idea that a new taxa or a new kingdom is going to be formed. So we're looking at the big, 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 big evolutionary jumps that happen as a result of, of many, many, many generations of natural selection. So recall that the six kingdoms of life are the bacteria, archaea, eukaryote in some way, shape, or form, including all of the different types of eukaryotes. Um, just like protists and plantae and animale and fungi. The original ancestors of all life is thought to be one single celled pro uh, prokaryote. So if all of those different uh, kingdoms came from one single prokaryotic cell, uh, how did that come to fruition? So how did living things or cells come from non-living things? Well, it's actually a, a question that we don't really have answers to yet. It's, it's one of the main concepts of study or focuses of study in a lot of biology fields and it's multifaceted in that it connects to so many different fields of genetics, uh, cellular biology, uh, animal biology, plant biology, all sorts of different components of biology are incorporated with the concept of abiogenesis. And so what we do know is that there are many important compounds needed for life and they can form outside of cells. For example, RNA, amino acids, proteins, DNA, hydrocarbons, they can all exist without actually being in a cell. In fact, many of them do uh, in terms of viruses, in terms of RNA strips outside of cells. There's many, many, many examples of components needed for life existing outside of the cell. So the number two thing that we know is that RNA molecules are able to replicate themselves without the help of cellular machinery. And, and a lot of scientists believe that these were the precursors to early cells as it allowed for genetic material to kind of replicate itself without being inside of a cell. And the cell kind of arose as a result of being able to provide protection for that genetic material and then it kind of snowballed afterwards. So many scientists believe that life existed on Earth for more than 3.5 billion years uh, and counting and has been evolving ever since. It took the eukaryotics at least two billion years to evolve during that 3.5 billion years. And it took several hundred millions of years from multicellular organisms like us to evolve. So once organisms evolved to have multicellularity, the diversity occurred rapidly. That multicellular component allowed for so many different niches within the environment to be filled once those selective pressures started to uh, allow for those things to be are allowed for those at like different types of eukaryotes to, to flourish. So evolution of eukaryotes from prokaryotes is, is, is a very fascinating topic of study. Uh, I mentioned it early in unit one, and I'm going to talk a lot about it here in this lesson where we look at prokaryotes and eukaryotes. So the idea here is that those prokaryotes have no nucleus or no mem nuclear membrane uh, bound organelles, and eukaryotes have all of those things. Recall that the two things that we looked at in unit one of infolding and endosymbiosis, the, the infolding is the nuclear membrane producing itself, and then endosymbiosis is the formation of new um, cell structures, the chloroplasts and mitochondria, as a result of taking in single-celled organisms into a more complex one. So there are many eras in Earth's history that kind of help provide evidence and uh, topics of study and discussion for us. Uh, one main thing to take and keep in mind here is that the eras in history were where diversity has been interrupted. Uh, there's been, that's been as a result of major extinction events. And then the boom as a result of those major extinction events uh, is a very interesting, fascinating topic to discuss. So um, these tectonic plate movements, rapid climate changes, ice ages, intense warming, asteroids from extrasolar activity, all of those are major extinction events. And that allows for that diversity to kind of follow afterwards. So when we look at the Cambrian explosion, it refers to the rapid diversification and evolution of animal phyla in approximately 40 million years, which is in the grand scheme of things, when you think about it being 3.5 billion years of evolution and life on the planet, 40 million years is like a tiny fraction of it. I think it's like 7%, not even. So this allowed for this huge boom over a very short period of time as a result of these niches that were left open once uh, an extinction event happened. So uh, it allowed for rapid movement and speed within animals and and, and that multicellular multicellularity led to speciation. So there's a couple of ideas that 
we talk about in in evolution with regards to macro evolution the ideas of gradualism versus punctuated equilibrium the the theory of gradualism states that new species evolve they kind of initially look similar to their ancestor and then they gradually accumulate changes over time if you were to think of humans and how they compare to any type of ape-like creature uh, we look similar but very different at the same time and those differences kind of gradually accumulated over time as the many different species that separate our, our ape ancestors and us kind of went through those changes. And then the, the idea or the theory of punctuated uh, equilibrium is that most changes are very slow and gradual, uh, but some happen quite rapid as a result of catastrophe or an extinction event. Um, I can't really think of any that come directly to mind. Uh, probably the uh, evolution of uh, smaller reptiles and, and, and bird-like creatures like chickens and turkeys from their ancestors of dinosaurs, which they're very closely related to. Um, if you really think about some of the lizards that we see here on Earth today and, and some of the pheasants and chickens that we see here to, on, on the Earth today, they look nothing like dinosaurs did, you know, a couple hundred million years ago. And so that rapid change as a result of a catastrophe is a way to kind of remember the idea of punctuated equilibrium. Uh, three main points just to, to remember is that new species evolve rapidly in evolutionary time. Uh, speciation occurs in small, isolated population, populations and leaves few transitional fossils or forms, these intermediates between ancestral and modern forms. And after a rapid evolution, additional changes are going to be very slow. It's, it's basically the summary of those two theories above, but it's those three main points to take away from this. Uh, cladistics and uh, phylogeny are the way we can illustrate the evolutionary relatedness based on those traits. And cladistics use uh, presence or absence of recently evolved traits, or what's called derived traits, as the key to determining how related those two groups are. Uh, two species who share a recently evolved trait um, in terms of the structure and shape of their traits is said to be called the synopomorphy, and they are thought to be more closely related to each other than groups that do not share that trait. Again, another example with regards to humans and chimps, uh, even though humans and chimps are, or sorry, even though we think of ourselves as being related to a multitude of other different species, humans and chimps are very, very closely related because we have those derived traits. So your job now to go through this tutorial, it's in the textbook as well if you want to take a look, um, but it's also posted in the classroom, is to kind of the construction of a cladogram. I have the instructions and set up there, and then there's some practice for you as well within that note. Um, if you do have questions about this, this can be a little bit tricky. If you do have questions, please let me know because I, you normally would do these examples with me through class and I would give you a specific example and then I would guide you through the example and then we would kind of take it up and you would work on some examples on your own and then we would take them up together as a class. But unfortunately, we don't have that luxury. So if you do have questions about creating a cladogram, uh, I encourage you to reach out to me. Otherwise, that's it for this lesson and I, I hope you're all well and take care.